Welcome. <laughs> Hello. It has been a while since I uh, had the last opportunity to stand here. I'd say a long time, but it's been more than that. It's been a great distance, about 3,000 miles, well, 5,051 kilometers, if you want to be exact. So it's wonderful for our family to be here. We are thankful for the opportunity to join with you in the work that God has already been doing here. Thankful for preaching here for the first time as your teaching pastor. As we pick up on the theme of welcome from this last week, we want to say to you, welcome to hope. I'm not sure what you came expecting, what you came shopping for, but we hope you find it. Our text continues from last week, even repeats a little bit of what Pastor Nicole had from last week as well. We're at the end of Luke, Luke chapter 24. So if you have your Bibles with you, you can open up your Bibles. If you have an electronic Bible, now would be a time to pull that out as well. Luke chapter 24. Just the last few verses. When he had led them out of the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As we read from God's word this morning. Will you join me in prayer as we, um, as we enter into this time of hearing from God? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it is our dear hope, it is our truest and most ardent hope that you are here with us. In the midst of the busyness of, uh, of life, nearing the, uh, the end of uh, a summer that has been warm and, and beautiful, but Lord, one that has also uh, allowed us to uh, see in September these new potential returnings to what a way of life that it used to be. We hope for some sort of routine. We hope for a future that, um, that is familiar. But Lord, it remains a little bit unseen. And so this morning, may we, as we enter into your, um, into your word, that your text may become alive to us, that we may see hope in a, in a new and different and almost impossible way. For Lord, if you are with us, then nothing else matters. And if you are not with us, then nothing else matters. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. In our text here, Jesus has just walked through Emmaus, surprising a few folks, and then he has found himself eating a, a fish breakfast alongside his disciples. He broke some bread, telling them and reminding them of the story that, that they had written together and what it meant for them. He was drawing pictures of, of hope for when he would be gone. Transitions in leadership look different uh, every, every single time, and so whenever there's a new person that comes in, you know, all the hellos and, and goodbyes, and it can seem a little jarring sometimes, the change. There's no training wheels for the disciples. They don't have you know, a special uh, opportunity to, uh, to spend a weekend with Jesus in retreat before this time of ascension. And yet they don't seem too phased by it, do they? They don't say much, maybe. Well, maybe it's because they'd already received the instructions. He said to them, stay in the city until you have been clothed from on high. It's specific, nondescript, maybe, but they took it to heart. They remained there. Do you imagine? How many times can you ask the band to play the same song? All right, guys, again from the top. You know, My hope is built on nothing less. I thought we already did the first verse. We did. It's okay. Just do it again. Jerusalem, there they are standing and worshiping and telling the stories of Jesus, reminding themselves and anyone who will kind of listen all that he had told them and all that he had done alongside of them. In this way, I, I get it. They had hope. 
They should be filled with hope after all. Jesus had shown them what hope was all about. They had these memories because they had been with him. They were inside of him. Maybe this is what hope looks like. Some people, they they come to a place like church to be reminded of what things like hope and what faith are supposed to look like. And the difficulty is, the reality behind hope is that there's no real image that we can conjure up. And the best that Google can do is a flower through a sidewalk. It's not as hopeful as you, well, it's not as hopeful as you hoped, is it? See, I've got a theory that hope doesn't seem so uh, evident in why the disciples are even encouraged in in this difficult time of transition, faithfully awaiting instructions. Why do they have hope? My my theory is is because they, they had already seen it before. He's about to lay out the details for the future. And then... He disappears, and he tells them to wait. (laughs) I'm not the best with delayed gratification, but maybe it's because we want hope to be so concrete that we can stand on it. We want to see hope, but hope doesn't work that way. Paul tells us that. In Romans chapter 8, he says, For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Paul's image for hope is no image at all. A flower in cracked pavement has no hope. Hope is nestled only in the place where the glimpses of what to come offer some respite. There's something to anticipate. What's there to anticipate for a flower in the cracks? There's little to do but die. There's no future for them. Overflowered, scattering seeds sent across the world. No, that's not hope. The disciples, they have something different than that. They did not grieve, as Paul tells the church in Thessaloniki. He tells them, do not grieve as those who have no hope, and so they don't. And in the seeming loss of this leader, this this hopelessness that should be there, the disciples react in a way that, that I just don't understand. Perhaps you struggle with it too, trying to see hope. What does hope look like? Maybe the church still knows. Maybe that's why you've come today, looking for a little hope, the hope of the nations. My problem is I'm not sure I can draw you a picture. You see, hope has no mass. It has no girth apart from faith. I have seen hope lost at the end of a political campaign or a treatment in the hospital that was supposed to work, and a cancer caught too late that even a young body can't recover from it. Prisoners locked away for a lapse in judgment in their youth or the color of their skin, growing up on the wrong side of some imaginary line, and now in some places of the world, 90 years, no parole. Hopeless. I've seen it in hospitals. I've been to those prisons. I've been in the community halls when the final speech was being read out. Well, people, we tried. It seemed like the world wanted something else other than the the status quo, but they wanted change, but well. Take an extra t-shirt with you and a bumper sticker. Congratulations to my opponent on a well-run race. We fought hard, and I want to thank everyone. What's that, 2024? No, I don't think so. (laughs) I think it's time we just went home. Well, unless you're able to help and clean up for a little bit. Rent in the building was free as long as we kept it clean. I know that you're tired, but if you'll just remain here in the city. 
The disciples are firm in their hope until the end. They remain, <laughs> literally. But hope requires that you know something of what is promised. How can you cherish and desire that which you've never seen? It is hope that looks forward to the embrace of a friend or a grandchild after a long time apart. It is hope in a seed that you turn into a soil that you hope turns into the very plant from which it was harvested. It is hope that creates for us the yearning for something that we cannot see as Lewis and others have described for us. It's as if we've seen a glint of this heavenly shore. And so Jesus, as he rises, he blesses and he promises and instills hope for unseen things. He instills faith in them and for us in the church, we continue to return, not to pick up some hope around us and, and take it home, but to return to the place again where we hear the stories of hope and see the hope-filled faces of those around us. Some churches even put hope in the title. Because this is a place where people come who believe in miracles not because they have witnessed them or experienced them some hand, though some have. No, rather because when we come, the miracle is God is already here. And he participates in our worship with us, lifting our eyes to see and our hearts to be filled again with hope. Hope is an interesting thing to study. So much so that in the 1950s, a, a professor from John Hopkins, I almost don't want to mention his name just in case, but Professor Richter, he decided he would find out just how hope-filled animals could be, and so he collected some rats. This is not a pleasant study to conduct, I'm sure, for anyone or for any of you to imagine. He took 38 wild rats, and he took some laboratory animals and this sort of thing as well, and he wanted to see how long they would survive if they were in a bucket of water. These wild rats, thinking, the theory was that they would be much stronger, natural abilities, and they would last way longer than these you know, homegrown, um, farm-raised rats. But in fact, within minutes, all of the wild rats succumbed to uh, their watery graves, unfortunately. And these other rats, the domesticated ones, they lasted for a little while longer, and some even for several hours. What, Mr. what Dr. Richter discovered, actually, is that with the domesticated rats particularly, if at some point nearing the time when it seemed like they had lost all hope and they'd begin to stop swimming, they would use an apparatus to lift the rat up out of the water to get respite for a moment, to catch its breath, and then would allow it to go again. When they did this to the rats, what ended up happening is that these domesticated animals would last, some of them, days for the reality that the hope a benevolent hand might somehow reach down and pluck them out how difficult it is for us to have to discover such things through such ways. But hope means something when you've seen it. This is part of the challenge within the gospel of Jesus Christ. Despite it being hopeful, if we do not have the stories of God, if we do not have the Spirit of God to lead us into that truth, the hope of the gospel can remain a mystery. We hope for something in our imaginations that we haven't been able to quite conjure up just yet. And it is our fallenness, that, that sin that we already spoke of this morning, that blunts our image and our glimpses of what heaven can be and our hope for eternity. And that is until Christ, who has seen, 
and who has been, comes to his followers and says, follow me. Last week, Pastor Nicole reminded us that this church is in the business of helping people follow. By welcoming him, people here as a place of fellowship, but also where we find peace and promise, we find purpose, power, his presence, and he, we find in all of that he has a plan for us as well. At this church, we even, we even try to tell you how we want to live it out in our mission statement. As I saw Pastor Nicole put that believe, belong, and bless up on the screen last week, I thought to myself, that's not a mission statement, that's a hope statement. Our hope is for you to believe. Our hope is for you to belong and to bless. We hope that you find these things for yourself and that this church is a place that as you walk its pathways, you're able to connect with hope-filled things and hope-filled stories. We do this because this is what the followers of Jesus do. They remain in fellowship. They remain in hope. We know this because of Jesus and how Jesus taught them. He taught them to have hope. If you take a look at the verses 44 through 48. First off, he taught them comprehensively. He says to them, everything that has been written about me, Moses and the prophets, the Psalms, you knew all this about me. He gives us that peace. He gives us his presence by telling us that whole story. And the story is comprehensive. Look at this, this massive information. And if you've been here and you've had an intellectual doubt of the existence of God and you've been challenged in your faith and you've been challenged in your hope, please, there's opportunity for us to have those conversations too as to how comprehensive God is in his revelation to us. But beyond that as well, it is also comprehensible. It means that we can understand him he is close to us as a brother. And even these disciples, simple fishermen, who, as we will discover in Acts chapter 2, they looked at these Galileans, these guys are really, these, the, these guys are the future hope. These are the ones to whom God revealed himself through Jesus Christ. They understood him. He wasn't elusive. God wasn't a wizard behind a curtain pulling, pulling cords on ropes and pulleys he was in the flesh and to luke the doctor this matters the bodily resurrected jesus who ascends it is real hands that is spread wide raised and blessing they knew it and he establishes as pastor nicole mentioned that plan and that purpose for us through the comprehensible story that he has more than that he has us covered he says, remain here and you will be clothed from on high. Reminding us that the Holy Spirit that was coming in Acts chapter 2, uh, the, only, the only interruption between uh, where we just read in Luke chapter 24 and Acts chapter 1 is the Gospel of John. <laughs> so if John wasn't there, if we can just kind of shift him around a little bit, you could just continue on the story and we'll see that next week. As they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, they become covered, they become clothed by the Holy Spirit. And that presence, that power was going to change and build the church. He blessed them in their work. They worshipped him in celebration and in, a, and in complete expression of who he had already revealed himself to be. They looked at the personification of hope itself. And if you can't do that, if you can't look into the eyes of the person who is hope itself, then that, my friends, that is hopelessness. And every time we walk the concrete pathways into this building and every time we pound it when we leave, we do, we pick up a little hope and we leave some behind. I heard a preacher once call it Sunday shopping. And I'm not talking about the kind that my Oma was against. I'm talking about the kind that people who walk through the door, who have a, a, a shopping cart in their mind, 
and they're thinking to themselves, I'm, I'm going to your other, your other picture here. And they're thinking to themselves, you know what I really need? I need a little prayer today. What aisle? I'm going to go to aisle three to pick up some prayer. Oh, there it is. Today is a heavy day. I would really like some patience with my children today. Oh, well, that's all the way on the bottom shelf. <laughs> Always is on the bottom shelf. <laughs> then there's those hard-to-reach places, theological discussions and stuff like that. Sunday shopping, walking down the hallways, picking up these things and taking them with. We search for hope. We search for fellowship. We search for faith. And so, friends, I'm telling you, don't leave here without the essentials. Don't fill up on the empty practice of the same thing over and over again. Don't just remain in Jerusalem. Remain in Jesus. He is our hope. You can put that other slide up. Every once in a while, it's fun to ask people a, a really an interrogative question. And um, this question came from this gentleman, Ted Lasso. If uh, my young friends are here, this is, uh, this is my mustache. Oh, here you go. He's got that famous look. 20 Emmys and all that wonderful stuff. I, I, this is not a, a pitch for the show or anything like that. And like I say, watch things like media appropriately and accordingly. But in the first season of this, uh, this show, and I'll give you a brief synopsis, Ted Lasso is an American um, football coach who coached in um, high school and in college and is brought over to England to lead a Premier League team. And if you know anything about soccer, that's kind of a you know, big deal where multi-million dollar contracts and all this stuff. And here's this guy who doesn't know anything about soccer who's come in. But he's all about changing the culture of people. And so he starts working on relationships within this group. And there's a saying through the whole first season of this, and it's, uh, it's the hope that kills you. You know, because they've they got all these fans of this soccer club that keep on raising the expectations and raising the expectations only to drop them to lay flat like an egg on the, on the pavement below. And there's a scene in this, uh, this season where, where Coach Lasso says, you know, you guys have this saying, and it says, it's, it's the hope that kills you. I'm going to tell you that's wrong. It's not the hope that kills you. It's the hope that keeps you going. He goes, we have another saying in the United States. It says, do you believe in miracles? I thought the only thing that I have, the only exception I have with that problem is, uh, the only problem I have with that question is he's asking it in the wrong place. And so, if you're, uh, one of your kids may have one of these walking around. So, kids, if you've got your, your mustache, you find someone today and you ask them, do you believe in miracles? And I'll tell you, I think you'll find a few people who walk around this place who do. Because they have hope. Because they know that the story, the comprehensive story, and the comprehensible story has got them covered. God is our hope. He is the hope to the nations, and he says to us, my power is complete. My plan is good. My purpose is sure. My presence is real. And my peace is yours if you place your hope in me. It's how we join in the chorus and saying, all our hope is in you. But maybe you've never done that before. Maybe you're here and you followed parts of the story before, but you've never done that. You've never placed your hope in Christ. I'm here to tell you that his story is complete and it is understandable and it's even accessible. We don't have to feel like the disciples stiff-necked looking up, looking at our last leader or staring down at the cracked pavement of life, friends, you too can have hope. 
Now, it comes at a cost. It costs the disciples something. To follow Jesus, it was an exchange for them, just like it's an exchange for us. They had to listen to his instructions. They followed him and trusted him. They placed their faith in him. And our hope is that you, as you participate with us here, and as we join in together next week as we celebrate fellowship, our hope is that you can join us in his story. Because it is for you. Because he continues to build his church. The book of Acts is ambiguous at the end and it includes the ongoing work and so hope in in this very way hope fellowship church is a continuation of the very story we continue to wait just not in jerusalem we wait on jesus and he continues to build this church and as we make those steps towards hope trusting in him to walk with us and towards us he does he makes that step towards you But it's not a step that we can make just on our own. It is his Holy Spirit, the power of his Spirit that draws us to him and that we find that hope and that peace. And if we find ourselves doubting God, running into our sin, trying to flee it, only to return again, we find that he promises a more hope-filled future where we find healing, where we find forgiveness, where we find we find hope. We don't have to drown in the, in the buckets of our lives filled with sin like a wet rat. He is the hand that plunges deep. And all we need but do is accept his offer. Sometimes we make that to seem as a really easy, really easy deal. And it is. It's simple. He wants our everything. Everything. He wants your doubts. He wants your fears. He wants the the violent outbursts or the pride or the bitterness that we see in all the disciples that were sitting there waiting in Jerusalem. He wants all of those things, but he also wants your time. He wants your worship. He wants your attention. He wants your love. Now, he makes an exchange with you for that. In exchange for your everything, he gives you his everything and if you're here and you've never made that exchange maybe that's why hope is just a little confusing to you don't leave here today without that hope i don't know what you came shopping for what you came looking for but if you've come to try and get some air and the promise of jesus hope Don't wait until next week. Don't wait for a hand to help you up again. Because this is what he says in his word to us in Romans 5. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, that's our ability to be answering the call to believe in him, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. Praise be to God, our Father. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity to gather this morning and just bask in your hope. As the disciples remained and continued to praise, their numbers grew. Their numbers grew, not only just in people, but Lord, in your presence, you were there with them. You are our hope, and you remain with them. You go before us and behind us, and within us by the power of your Spirit. And so, Lord, we just come before you now, not shopping in a, in a way that we can take something home that is consumptive, but, Lord, we, we've come here looking for something that can consume us. By your Spirit's power, we pray. Consume us, Lord. Allow us to worship you freely. Allow us to find ourselves more more in love with you, following your word, remaining close to you and where you've called us. Speak to us loudly, Lord, we pray. In Christ's name I pray.
Amen.